Hello and welcome to episode 10 of season 3 of Free Speech. I realize that this episode is being released slightly later than we anticipated, but given the topic, we wanted to make sure that we were able to really synthesize all the information that we possibly could to give you guys an accurate understanding of what's changed since I made the first video at the beginning of the season. And at the beginning of the season, we recorded a video about the coronavirus when there were 5,000 positive uh, tests for people who had been inflicted by the disease, and it was just kind of getting started. Um, the news cycle was beginning to talk about it, um, and this was late January. And now we're at a very different point. Um, you know, we're nearing the end of the year. 55 million people have tested positive, and in between 5,000 and 55 million people testing positive, there have been a lot of different changing narratives and perspectives. And so in the initial video that we made, we told people, and this is when there are 5,000 cases, watch it very intently, but you know, don't necessarily let it ruin your life or stop your tracks. But what has happened in between that point and now is that it has done that. It has stopped the world in its tracks and 55 million people have tested positive. There are plenty of countries that have had over a million positive tests. And so in this video, we're gonna talk about a few different things. We're gonna talk about positivity rate. We're gonna talk about the climate in different countries, what different places um, kind of have done to, to meet with this problem. And ultimately, um, we will be ushering in our new season, season four, which has super, super exciting topics. So we're really excited to get into that. But we wanted to make sure we were true to our word and did a follow-up video to kind of talk about the changes since it first broke out to now. So without further ado, um, like I said, 55 million uh, positive tests around the world. What are some of the countries that are spiking or what are some of the countries that are of interest because they're high positivity rates? So, you know, we've heard a lot about America. We've had lockdowns, we've had curfews, we've had all sorts of things that have been measures. Um, we've had the mask wearing movement, which the beginning of this in January wasn't even a, a topic of discussion. So um, in, in India, uh, a country where they have over a billion people, there are 9 million cases and it's increasing at an absurd rate, something that um, we, we couldn't have expected. But at the same time, you also have to think to yourself, in a country with a GDP per person of $2,000, are they really going to be able to intimately test their population and understand which people do and do not have the coronavirus. And I think that we have to remember in a country like America where the GDP per person is over $60,000, um, we, we have a lot of resources. We have a lot of infrastructure set, that's set up to be able to um, test people to see whether or not they have this. And so in India, in a country where most people don't even have uh, health care nearly, nearly at the level uh, of an industrialized nation, you know, we have to question, are these numbers accurate? And when you look into them, every every single person collecting this data in India, they will tell you, this is just the minimum uh, of what's out there. There are a lot of situations that we can't get to simply because of the enormity of what's going on. And then you look at Brazil, a country where there's also 6 million cases and uh, over 100,000 people dying. And, th and that's a country with a GDP of less than $10,000 per person. You have to wonder, the data that we're collecting, how accurate is it? And, and no one can know. And I think that that's something that, that we should reiterate too, is that there are plenty of people who tell you they're the expert on what's going on. I certainly don't claim that you know, about myself, but I would say this, even the people who are epidemiologists, the experts who have spent their entire life trying to respond to something exactly like this, they also are suggesting that they are in the dark as well that um, you know, anyone who says that they know the absolute truth with the situation is clearly lying. And so I think with everything we wanna take, take what we know is a, with a grain of salt, but one area that you can look that I think is super fruitful is the positivity rate. You know, in America, the positivity rate is at about 12.3% as of the making of this video. But then you look at countries like Mexico where the positive test rate is 53.4%, about four times what it is in America. Now, obviously, Mexico, the, the GDP per person is around 10,000. Um, they, they've had a million cases, around 100,000 deaths. But what their scientists are also saying is that we don't know the vast majority of the cases that have happened. They're, they're, we're in the dark about a lot of the data, a lot of the empiricism. And so that's where, taking things with a grain of salt, you begin to realize that these numbers are definitely uh, helpful indicators of, of how we're doing. And 
what different uh, responses that we've had, what the cause and effect of those have been. But at the end of the day, you're still going to have places like Mexico testing about 50 percent. Poland is testing at 47 percent. We've seen 750,000 cases there. Um, but ironically enough, both Poland and Hungary blocked the um, United Nations coronavirus relief bill, which would have been, I think it was $888 billion, and it would have sent funding to 27 different um, member nation states. So people have all had their varying response, but then maybe you look at, let's say, one of the poorest countries in the world, Congo, with a 16% positivity rate. So in one of the poorest countries in the world, we pretty much know with absolute certainty that we're not going to be able to have widespread testing in a place like that unless someone steps in and goes there and offers free tests, which is going to be uh, an incredible, an incredible infrastructure commitment. And so, you know, there is, a, there is a lot of perspective around the world of, you know, we know what's going on with this. But I think in reality, if we're truly honest with ourselves, we don't know too much quite yet. But what we do know is that within the past year, we have seen the effect that a pandemic can have on a global economy, on the mental well-being of people around the world. I mean, in America especially, we've seen massive, massive, massive increases in the rate of suicide. So we're now privy to the idea that when something like this happens, perhaps we need to ready mental health resources to be able to properly respond to a pandemic stepping in the way of people living their lives in the way they intended to. And I think if we're, if we're truly honest with ourselves, we know that to some degree, everybody's life has been impacted by this, whether the effect has been minimal or substantial, meaning family members passing away, um, plenty of difficult situations, difficult conversations have been had at a geopolitical level, but I think that there's a lot to learn from this situation. And now for the much more optimistic aspect of this video, we're going to talk about the development that has occurred with vaccines. And this is turning the corner. This is something to look at for optimism in a situation where we have seen a lot of people die. We have seen a lot of people sick. Um, we have seen a lot of people lose their jobs. This is something that is a good sign that is a light off in the distance. Um, the two main companies that are the head of the topic of conversation are Moderna, Pfizer, but then you also have other contributing companies. You have companies in Russia working on a vaccine. And so this is an interesting mathematical breakdown of the Moderna vaccine, which so far has been the most effective. So with the Moderna test, we found that it was 94.5% effective. And the way that they came to this conclusion is that they gave out the uh, vaccine to 30,000 people. And 25% you know, of them are older than 65, 63% white, 20% Hispanic, 10% black, 4% Asian. So they're trying to make it at least slightly representative of the American population. Um, and from there, 95 people got sick. And so of those 95 people, 90 of them were part of the placebo group. They split the group of 30,000 people up 50-50. 95 got sick. 90 of them were from the uh, placebo group, and five of them were from the group that took the vaccine. And so we know that the earliest that a vaccine is going to be widespread is probably going to be around spring. But one of the interesting findings from the Moderna study was this, among others. Um, so of, of the 95 people that got sick, 11 of them were severely sick. These are the cases we're hearing of people on ventilators, um, potentially having you know, life, even if you don't pass away, life-altering changes that occur as a result of getting sick from this. Um, none of those 11 people took the vaccine. So what is promising about this Moderna vaccine is the idea that even if you do end up getting the virus, that the case is much, much less likely to be extreme to cause death. And so and that is very, very promising in one aspect of the Moderna virus that I think people have a lot of hope about. And so... Um, well, the one difference between Moderna and the, uh, and the Pfizer vaccines that we've seen is this. Moderna accepted the federal government's offer of Operation Warp Speed. They actually took about a billion dollars in support from the federal government. That is not the case in reverse. 
Pfizer has suggested that they do not want to be a part of Operation Warp Speed, and so they opted out of uh, the money that they were offered through the program. Um, and then, you know, we looked to foreign, foreign scientific investigations like um, Sputnik V, which is the Russian vaccine that has also proven to be over 90% effective. And then there's AstraZeneca. Johnson & Johnson has been working with a lot of people in government to come up with a solution for this. Um, and then we also see other companies con conducting phase three trials to see what is it that we could possibly do to come up with something that could save hundreds of thousands, millions of lives. And the speed at which people have done this is incredible. We, this is very unprecedented. We've never had such a focus towards one specific cause like this in my lifetime and from my historical perspective ever in the history of the world. Um, and so there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We do have companies like Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson Johnson who are um, putting an absurd amount of research and development investment into figuring out what we can do to address this issue. So we've gone from 5,000 cases to 55 million from the first season to the last season of, uh, or from the first episode to the last episode of this season of free speech. And, you know, ultimately I wanted to wait until there was some hope. I wanted to wait until there was something optimistic that I could bring to the conversation. I think that uh, this is that. And so, you know, we'll see where the world progresses. We'll see what happens with the economy in the next year. We'll see what happens with international relations in the next year, you know, whether countries are going to allow people to go from one country to the next. But in general, this vaccine should serve as a beacon of hope for everyone in any corner around the world that we can move on from this, that this isn't going to be an eternal situation. And I think that moving on to this next season of free speech, hopefully we can delve into 10 really interesting topics. But this season will ultimately always be something that I will look back on and think, wow, I can't believe, A, that we talked about uh, the virus when there were only 5,000 cases. Uh, you know, this is late January when hardly anyone was talking about it. And now we're at the point where this has completely fundamentally changed the way people live, the way people think about life and society. And so if there is any individual aspect of the situation that you want us to talk about on the podcast, leave it in the comments. Otherwise, please subscribe. Follow us on Instagram. Um, if you live in California, our Instagram in California is Natural California. If you live in Washington, our Instagram is Natural Washington, and the same for all 50 states around the country and Canada. So give us a follow on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and we will see you guys at the beginning of next week with a super exciting episode of uh, Season 4 of Free Speech. This is uh, Patrick Stepanek. Thank you guys for your time, and we love all of you.